Good evening TCF Church family and it is Wednesday the 16th of June and welcome to another devotion uh, at 7 going through our yearly reading scheme which we're following the F260. This Sunday at the church we will be continuing our studies in Luke and uh, the passage that we are looking at uh, this Sunday is a fantastic passage, the latter part of Luke 8 when there's just some amazing stories and Jesus' interaction with people. So we just encourage uh, you to be online or to join us in person and uh, to, to fellowship together and to sit under God's word. Just before we come to our Bible readings for this evening, let's pray, shall we? Father, we come before you. We thank you for the improved freedoms the relaxation of some of the restrictions and we pray that you would continue to help the country and lead the politicians and doctors that they would turn to you for wisdom and that we would exit this situation by your grace and your goodness and your guidance i pray that you would keep us safe and that you would watch over us and as Father, as we come to this portion of your word where your sovereignty and your overall control of nations is affirmed, we want to say that anything that happens is under your control, is within your permissive will, and you use all circumstances uh, in the way that you see fit in the plans of man. So I pray that you would be with us this evening now as we turn to your word, that you would help us to understand more from it, for I ask this in the Lord's precious name. Amen. And so obviously in my prayer there, one of the things I said is that we are affirming God's sovereignty, God's control over the nations and the circumstances of men and the situations that we find ourselves in. We are clearly in a difficult situation. You know, there is still some restrictions. Things are improving, but we are locked down. And there's challenges. There's economic challenges. There's health challenges, both physical and mental. There's the challenge of the pandemic, uh, the political instability around the world. There is multiple things that can cause us anxiety, cause us to question God. And the passages that we have in Second Kings, are, they're sad passages. There is hope laced within them. But essentially, the, the, the run of Second Kings, after the nation divides, after the northern tribes revolt, after the death of Solomon, we have this constant run of good kings, bad kings. But essentially the majority bad kings that lead the people away from God. And in the northern tribes, in 2 Kings 17, this is, this is what we see. There is a king, Hosea, not Hosea, Hosea, I think is how it's pronounced. And again, he does what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. And they had been warned via the prophets. They had been warned repeatedly to turn back to God. God had been patient. God had warned them what would happen. And yet the northern kingdom, and we'll get to the southern kingdom in a minute of Judah, the northern kingdom repeatedly did not do what God said. And it's going to take my Bible here. And in chapter 17, verse 12, we read this. They served idols, Although the Lord had told them, you must not do this. Still the Lord warned Israel and Judah through every prophet and every seer, saying, turn, your, turn from your evil ways and keep my commands and statutes according to the whole law I have commanded your ancestors and sent to you through my servants the prophets. But they would not listen. Instead, they became obstinate like their ancestors who did not believe the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenant. He had made with the covenant, his covenant he had made with their ancestors and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. 
following the surrounding nations the Lord had commanded them not to imitate. And there's just this tragedy of messages being sent again and again, prophets being sent, seers being sent, the book of the law being available, and the people rejected it. And what happens is at the end of chapter 17, Assyria in the north comes and destroys the northern kingdoms. And the people from the north who had made Samaria their capital city are taken off into exile, just as the prophets had said. And so we look at this and we think, why was God judging this nation? But what we need to remember is this. God had not flown off the handle to use human vernacular. He had not just lost his temper. His patience had been displayed again and again and again. Even with Ahab, God had displayed some patience. But the kings and the people had rejected the word of law, the law, the word of the law and the word of the Lord through the prophets. So they had been given over, they had misbehaved. They had given themselves over to the judgment of God because they were steeped in their sin. Now in chapter 18, we have a different situation. We have the southern kingdom. And in the southern kingdom, a man comes to power called Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is summarised by saying he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the practices of his father, David. And Hezekiah's reign was a good reign. There was still political difficulty from the north. And in the latter chapter of 18, Hezekiah pays a tribute to the king of Assyria. And he's scraping gold from the temple and stuff like that, which is not ideal. And Isaiah is speaking into the situation of Hezekiah. And Isaiah tells Hezekiah to have faith in God, to believe in God, because God is in control. And in chapter 19, if we go forward to chapter 19, what has happened is the king of Assyria has come down. He's come down into the land. And Jerusalem and the southern kingdom is in danger of falling. And Hezekiah is crying out to the Lord. He's crying out to the Lord. He's praying to the Lord. And he seeks Isaiah's counsel. And he asks God for help. So do you see the difference? Other kings had refused the help of the Lord. They had refused to go to God themselves. They had refused to go to the prophets. And they had refused to go to the book of the law. Hezekiah goes to the Lord. Hezekiah goes to the prophets and seeks counsel. And God provides an answer. God provides an answer um, through Isaiah to Hezekiah. And we see that in the latter, the second half of chapter 19. But if we read part of this reply from Isaiah, starting in verse 25. Have you not heard? I designed it long ago. I planned it in days gone by. I have now brought it to pass, and you have crushed fortified cities into piles of rubble. And so Isaiah is saying that God knew what Assyria was going to do to the northern tribes. God was in control. In fact, God had planned it and had brought it to pass. I'm currently reading a book by Tozer called The Knowledge of the Holy or The Knowledge of the Almighty. And it's a very interesting book. It's a very rich book. Some of the language is quite difficult and with Tozer you sometimes have to read the same paragraph two or three times to get what he's saying. But the overarching theme of this book is that God is different from us 
us. His ways are not like our ways. He is above us. And whatever understanding we have of him is incredibly limited. And it is only because God has chosen to reveal certain bits about himself. And so I don't understand how God is able to use the Assyrians and the Assyrians are still acting as the Assyrians. But what I want to affirm is that God is in control. And God promises to protect Hezekiah and Jerusalem. And this is what he says in chapter 19 verse 34. I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. And this is very important because again and again in the Old Testament when we read this, we see God doing things for the glory of his name or for his name's sake or for the promises that he has made. And so in this instance... Assyria does not overthrow the southern kingdom. Assyria is not able to come and destroy Jerusalem. God prevents that from happening. He intervenes and defends the city for his own sake and for the sake of the promises made to his servant David. At this time, in Hezekiah's reign, God defends the city. Because God is the one who is in overall charge. And Hezekiah passes away. And we then have two terrible kings. One of which is called Manasseh. Or Manasseh. And he is a terrible person. He's involved in child sacrifice. And it does leave you to wonder... What was going on in the royal line, in the royal families, in the nation, when one king could come and do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and then the next king come and be an absolute disgrace? But Judah maintains, is maintained during the reign of these terrible kings. And then, in chapter 22, we read of another king being born. And another king coming to the throne. And his name is Josiah. And he is eight years old when he ascends to the throne. And yet despite his young age, Josiah follows the ways of the Lord. And introduces incredible reform. The idolatry, the idol altars... The idolatry of the nation is taken away. He wipes it out. But not only that, the book of the law is found. The book of the law is read. And Josiah is distraught when he sees what is in the book of the law. And he falls in repentance and realises the way the nation has behaved is an affront to God. He calls the people together and the law is read to the people from the least to the greatest. And there is covenant renewal to follow the law. But not only that, the Passover is reinitiated and the people follow the Passover. They remember their exodus. They remember their rescue by God. They remember God standing in the gap and defending them. And rescuing them. And bringing them across the Red Sea. And it is a time of spiritual blessing. And renewal. And a young boy of eight. A young boy of eight. Follows the ways of the Lord. And turns the people back to God. And that would be a good place to end wouldn't it? But unfortunately, the reforms of Josiah don't last. And the southern kingdom continues to rebel. And into this situation comes the prophet Isaiah. 
um, uh, sorry, Jeremiah. Isaiah is also speaking, but the readings this week are Jeremiah. And in the first three chapters, we see how Jeremiah is set apart for God to proclaim the message of God. But the people don't listen. And they are exiled into Babylon. And then in the other readings on Friday, we read in 25 and 28. And these are letters to the exiles. When God says, yes, you are exiled, but I will not forget you. And there is a plan and there is a purpose and I am going to bring you back. And the, th this verse in Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, sorry, I really don't understand why I'm getting the two of them confused today. My apologies. The verse that is commonly quoted in Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And people have them in little texts in their house and little cards that they carry in their wallet or key rings. And it is an amazing verse. But the important thing about this verse is it comes to a people broken in exile. And the plans God has for them at that time are uncomfortable. But there is a plan to bring them back. Because there is a long-term goal. There is a long-term plan. And the people have to come back. The nation has to be reformed. Because one will come that everything points to. And exile is this theme that exists throughout the Bible. Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden. The people of God are brought to a land. They are brought to a place of blessing and are then exiled. And we are told in the New Testament that we are exiles. That this is not necessarily our home. This is not necessarily where we belong. That we have now joined the family of God. We have now joined another kingdom. And we are living in exile, waiting, waiting to be brought home for the plans of God to come to fruition, for the plans to prosper us and not to harm us will be complete, for the plans where we will seek him with all our hearts and a new heart and a new holiness will be part of our existence and we will follow him unashamed and sinless, in perfect unity with him, worshipping him and our Father and the Holy Spirit and being joined in worship with the angels and all the heavenly host as we worship the Trinity in heaven for eternity. But while we live in this exile, we wait in hope. And I know I feel like I've said this all the time without all of these readings. And that is because the Bible is one big story. Made up of many, many, many littler stories. About God bringing us home. And God restoring us to himself. Why? Why? Not because of anything in us, but for his name's sake and for his glory and to the praise of his son for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you hold all things in your hand. Help us to understand this. Help us to trust this. Help us to hope in this. Help us when our doubts and our fears crowd us. 
when it feels like the world is going to overwhelm us. Please enable us by your spirit to cling on and to sit and to trust in you. For we ask this in the Lord's precious name. Amen. Good night, everybody. Hopefully we'll see you at the weekend. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us. To find out more about Teesside Christian Fellowship, visit tcfperth.org.uk. Together, we worship Jesus and communicate his love in all we do and say.